Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Friendly Jimmy's podcast. Have you noticed something different today, Jordan? No. What is it? Um, actually, that was a trick question. There is nothing different. Yeah, this is the podcast every time. If you're tuning in for the first time, this is actually a surprising amount of people that are on this podcast. Most of the time, it's just Ali. He stole the name off me, and he sometimes coaxes me in just with the realisation that, hang on a second, no, this is my apartment, and that's my name. Maybe I should sit down. But other than that, it's just him talking about his favourite thing in the world, beagle breeds that are off colour. <laughs> that's my recent <laughs> obsession. My OG obsession was Tinder. Yeah, that's right. I miss and you're still days. into it. The only suggestion you've given me in five <laughs> years, you should do one on Tinder, man. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, you know what? I, I think this could be good. I'm going to write it. I'll write uh, a script on um, uh, rating dating sites. Yeah, but w- what's the go with it? It's, I right. know your I'll rating to you. it. It's just don't go on Hinge. No, I'll tell you. Tinder, if you're hot and 18... Mm. And uh, I, have, you, have you heard this? I recently saw this meme. This applies to every chick on Tinder. So the meme was, do you know why every girl on uh, Tinder is super feminist? It's because they've been filled up with too much testosterone. Why? Because <laughs> they keep having sex. The guys keep coming oh, right. <laughs> That's basically Tinder. <laughs> and the okay. other thing. Man. Such like, uh, I miss that one. And you know why? Because I don't live in the Western suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> so something that anybody that has heaps of protein shakes. Like, <laughs> True, eh? <laughs> that and the other category on Tinder is, um, I've got already, I'm hot, so I've got already too much attention. I don't need this, but I still want Instagram followers. So please follow me on Instagram. I don't understand why this has become the go-to guide to success on Instagram. Here's a better idea. How about you upload those same pictures to Instagram? <laughs> no, they won't. Why? Well, they already have them there. It, it's the smartest thing ever because girls have figured out... That most of their Instagram followers are going to be guys. Specifically, well, yes. Saudi Arabian guys. Well, that's what Instagram pretty much is now. Yeah. It's just a thirst trap. It's thirst trap. That actually mm. reminds thirst me. Follow trap. me on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> you thirsty? <laughs> Come get quenched. Um, but no, that's legitimately what Instagram has become. Instagram should also be a dating website now. Mm. It's basically that. Like, mm. hot girls put up pictures about how awesome their lives are. They get millions of direct messages saying, come on, uh, hang out with me once, which they always uh, do not reply to or reply by saying, go get a life Mm. until they get that one really hot looking guy. And he's like, oh, my God, it was so cute. I met him on Instagram. It's not even a hot guy. It's tech billionaire. Is that it? I think that's what everyone's waiting out for now. Oh, I looked this up. Apparently, I looked up the list of professions that women find most attractive on Tinder. Intriguing. Hair dresser. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was one of the least. Yeah, of course it would be. <laughs> male hairdresser. Hey. Is there such a thing as a heterosexual male it's- hairdresser? If you know any male heterosexual hairdressers, let us know. And, and the only way that you can prove to me that they are heterosexual is you have caught them having sex in the act. You would have had to have watched it, just stepped in and be like, oh my God, my girlfriend, that's it. Wait, that's not true. Like, don't you, any, every leb haircutting shop. Stand corrected, carry on. <laughs> but, <laughs> is some guy that's super heterosexual just, yeah, and he tells you every time. Like, even if he brushes your elbow a little bit, he tells you, by the way, I'm not gay, all right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm not gay, bros. But they're not even, does a barber shop count? A barber <laughs> shop is not a hairdresser. Uh, wait, if you have 50 cent playing, it, when you're getting your hair cut, you're not a hairdresser. This I'm is, sorry. This is your inner model coming out. For most of the male population, that is a hairdresser. See, that's the whole thing. I, yes, that is true. But I do go to those hair salons where they go, okay, so with the uh, university discount, that comes to $170. <laughs> you know, okay, this is what I've uh, recently experienced. And I think th- th- this should be like in textbooks from now onward. Korean people know how to do hair yeah they do they are insane i was in strathfield i wanted to get a haircut i go to one of those random you know those uh like st- uh, korean version of like a a, a shitty 20 dollars shop which isn't it amazing that all the sign pictures out the front 
It's just guys with bowl cuts. <laughs> or K-pop members. It's like, I'm not sure if you can yeah, this guy yeah, yeah, but, but K-pop members just have the same hair as the Backstreet Boys. So <laughs> it's kind of like looking at a kebab on the picture and thinking, no, I don't think I'll be getting that. And you walk out and another guy that was daring enough to walk in is looking at you with a your loss glance because the picture is always terrible. And in fact, that is a good sign for a good kebab shop. The worse the picture is, the better the kebab is going to be. <laughs> and I think that's the same. It's just a rule that stands exclusively their- with Lebanese kebab shops and Korean hairdressers. They've got their priorities right. They're not focused on the, the, the marketing. They're no. focused on the food. <laughs> the product. <laughs> yes. But, exactly. Uh, so I go into this uh, Korean uh, hairdresser, right? So I'm yeah. just thinking it's normal. So I walk in, and uh, she's like, um, uh, "You, you, you go get uh, hair wash first. Mm. And I've never experienced that. Like normally, when you go to a lab barber shop, the last thing they tell you is go get it. They just want to get they just you cut there. It. They've got a machine. They don't mm. cut it. They never cut it. They've no. got a machine that they lawn mow your ass with, right? Just cuts is nicer. <laughs> yeah. So, so she didn't do that. So she was like, uh, go get a hair wash. And my response was, no, I'm okay. Thank you. She's like, I'm not asking. I tell it, go get hair wash. And I was like, okay. So then this other Korean chick escorts me back. And then they like shampoo the shit out of my hair, which was actually rather nice, if I may say so. It's a it's good activity. A great experience. And that's the um, extra $150 in the $170 haircut. Yeah. So then I do that. And then I come back, sit on the chair. And then this this Korean chick, by the way, she speaks like very limited English, yeah. but she knows English well enough to insult me. So she goes like, okay, now acceptable. <laughs> So then I sit there, right? The thing is, I tell her how I want my hair, and she tells me how I'm wrong. And then she gives me a haircut herself. Mm. And I have to be honest, she, she was knew. right. Yeah. She knew exactly what was. Mm. So I was just saying, yeah, just 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 trim from the back, go with the machine. She's like, no, your your hair too big. Your up, your, the above part of your hair too fat. So uh, you gotta go slope. Don't, 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 don't. So basically she was saying that every haircut that I've ever gotten in my life was completely wrong. Are you sure she wasn't Chinese? I've never heard a Korean that, that is that rude. That says, quote, your head is fat. Yeah, well, I think she was being nice. I think she was like trying to explain to me that there is a way you can fix your head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she was right. Because like the, the top of my head does bump out every time I bend or something. Oh, really? So she was like- so have a little Diplodocus extension out the back. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you call uh, KFC gravy Diplodocus, then yes. <laughs> Okay, right. That's no, the gravy layer. I think that's my gravy yeah. layer. It's just, just at the back. It sits at the top. Yeah. Extra um, layer of skin, just like extra crispy chicken. But now it is hidden behind a bunch of hair thanks to this Korean lady. Yeah, I and mean, I've got to say, the results do show. It's <laughs> very nice. I didn't notice it, but now that I'm actually having to look at it, yeah. I, I like the fact that you look like an 1800s composer that was given a grant by a baron. He had six months, and it's been five and a half months. <laughs> he is, and he is the, some sleepless nights. The possibilities of renewal are low. <laughs> yes. And the only way yeah, he he's thinks- He's wow him. You thought eight mile was epic. This guy <laughs> struggled so much worse. Dude, you know what? You have that hair. But the only way I think I can get an extension is go back to that Korean job. Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, how yeah. you get it. Um, okay. No, that was true, actually. I remember that as well. I remember that when I was in Korea, the modeling agency would take me to one that was specifically Western. And I went there, and it was one of the worst haircuts I've ever had in my life. And then I went to the barber shop that was just at my university. Not barber shop, hairdresser. And it was hairdressing students. So it's the worst move you could possibly make. But I was lazy, and I was sick of asking people where Dong Gong is. So... <laughs> Hey, what's Dong Gong? It was just a suburb. Um, so I, uh, I I had it there. And yeah, take me back. Mm. Those were the best haircuts of my life and the best exchanges as well because it was none of those. Have you got any plans for the weekend? I don't know why every oh, okay. hairdresser in Australia is British, but here we go. But you know, are you? do you like that? Do you like when the... Uh, because the, there is this whole idea, historically speaking, a barber knew more about you than anyone else. You had a very intimate relationship with your barber. Um, barbers, actually, back in the day, at least in like India and Pakistan, 
barbers had a few uh, roles. It wasn't just cutting hair. One of the things was that they would they were the ones who would bring proposals for marriage. So Whoa. so people so like an eligible bachelor would be getting a haircut and be like, "Yep, I'm ready. I'm ready to get my dick wet." And he was like, "All right, all right, I'll go around." So a barber exclusively was the barber's job. There's no one else that would do it. Now apparently, I think things have changed, and now clerics do similar shit. But like back in the day, it was barbers, and in Pakistan, the other job that barbers had, <laughs> would you believe this, circumcision. <laughs> Haircut, yeah. marriage well, proposal, it makes and circumcision. Yeah, no, that's that's the way it should be. Because they know everyone in town yeah. and they've got the tools. They do. So they've like why isn't that happening here? Because <laughs> it's like it's you know, why are they now combining hairdressing with a tobacconist? <laughs> that's the Australian version of that. Yeah, why is that? But I don't know if that's the best way to do it, because apparently their circumcisions were really simple. They would get scissors and they go boop. <laughs> <laughs> so they just cut your knob off. <laughs> to a little child. <laughs> Basically cut your knob off. Yeah, that's that's how it works. Well, I didn't even know that that was a tradition in Islam. I thought that those were safe. <laughs> but are you are you circumcised? Yeah. But apparently, like, my circumcision wasn't... I actually, By a barber. It wasn't barber. It was no, you were from hospital. the elite. They imported but, but, a rabbi. But I'm telling you... And got you, special exemptions because they're not allowed to come in from Israel. Till this day, my mom says how she regrets not going to a barber and going to the hospital. Mm. Because according to her, my circumcision job was really bad. Was, uh, they, they, they left more skin <laughs> than they should have, basically. Yeah, look, it's just a soggy piece of hair, yeah. really. Like, hair is just skin. They know what they're doing. Yeah, they know what they're doing, and and so she, so yeah. Apparently, I don't know. The man. only, the only difference is you might have. A few. No, I think that it would have been clean. The only problem is it would have been a clean cut, but it wouldn't have been clean. It wouldn't be clean. So yeah. you could have died of an infection. <laughs> but I think that's kind of worse because is yours a bit lopped? Is it? No, it's not lopped. It's just there's there's slightly more skin than like a normal circumcised one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So they did a hatchet but it's, job. It's half circumcised, basically. Half circumcised. I got exposed the other day. Um, the, like I was at the pub and someone was. Uh, they were talking about like sex and like how sex can be gross. And uh, so this chick was saying, "I never let any guy finger me unless I've seen them uh, wash their hands in front of me." Mm. <laughs> so Good was, policy for someone who hangs around in a pub. Yeah, I was kind of laughing, and then this. <laughs> Yeah, and there was this other guy. I think it was her boyfriend who was saying, um, um, "Yeah, he was making a joke about you know that goo that comes under your uh, on your penis on top of your penis. Um, that's uh, that's hygienic." He was saying something about that, and my response was, "What goo?" And <laughs> and he knew exactly what I was talking. It's like that's because the rabbi got your skin. <laughs> oh no. I didn't know that smegma. Of course, it'd get trapped yeah, under there. It would, and it would probably be really gross. All right, I think that's the first question of tonight. Do you have smegma? <laughs> <laughs> oh, also for those of you wondering, uh, Miss Love is not here. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't noticed, he thought already. he was going to come out under the table, or as is usual, him saying that he's going to be at the gym for a brisk thirty minutes, and it ends up being two and a half hours. Yes. Um, so it's so right. weird that that man is swollen now. He shouldn't be. He should just look permanently like ET. Send us your questions or anything you want us to do for the pre-show. Uh, also, uh, I'll say this again on the pod, but for those of you who sent your job applications for the producer position, thank you very much. We are going through them. We have almost finalized or shortlisted a few interviews. So thank you. We appreciate that. Is there, um, is there anything they want to know? So... Yes, people are constantly talking. Uh, all right, Goonsack is asking to go through Ali's sex history. That's the Up Late podcast, and I think you know that, Goonsack double O. Don't try and get those two podcasts twisted. There's a reason people pay for that premium podcast, and it's to just know about Ali's sexual organs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and mostly ass. You'd think it's penis, but yeah, mostly no, ass. Yeah, well, that's a sexual organ. <laughs> That's the best and uh, yeah, people are asking, uh, is Miss Love all right? Well, the answer to that is no. I think he's still hanging around his car, waiting for the NRMA to come as he had locked his keys in his car. <laughs> he's locked his keys in his car, but that's not why he's not here. And, and the funniest that, thing- uh, That is actually why he's not here. 
I don't think he's left. His first response to that was, should I just break the glass? <laughs> <laughs> Not thinking. Well, his car's a crap show anyway. Um, are the riots are the same? Look, well, that's what we're going to talk about during the pod. Both Jordan and I have like uh, takes on it. Yes. And I the don't... very weighing opinions that you've all been waiting for, which is things that we have kind of cobbled together from the Young Turks and CNN, the two most obnoxious news sources on Earth, <laughs> and we just pretend it's ours. <laughs> Jemison just said, American here, I think I know your opinion on capital storming, but I still want to hear it. I don't think they do. All right, no, now you're going to have to give us a little taste. What do you think? Yeah, what do you was? think? What do you think, uh, James, what uh, the opinion is? Yeah. Alice, what is your favorite K on girl? Are you an... A Zunyan fan I think I'm Boomer Is that like a Manga reference Do you know what that is <sighs> What Why do I have to do The podcast with this guy <laughs> Why tell me Tell me What is it What is it Is it Japanese No What that- <gasps> ah, I am just an honorary Asian person I Actually get triggered By what Dave Chappelle Was talking about Where they go Hey Make you think I'm Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm so K-pop band? Yeah, it's okay, K-pop. Okay, okay. Uh, I, but I'm not too deep in the lore to know the difference between them. All I know is they're all hot. And I tap every last one of those fucked cyborgs. <laughs> Don't you think they do look like cyborgs? I'm always saying well, that about my girlfriend. Cyborgs. My girlfriend looks like one of those, right? And obviously I think she's gorgeous because she's my girlfriend. But I do... <laughs> also point out to her every single day you're a robot and she fervently denies it which is exactly what ai would do because they're smart enough to trick you but there's no way that those don't you think that they have that look to them Mm. their faces are too symmetrical for a human being that's why they're really good at studies too why because it's symmetry they're just they're they're (laughs) self-learning yes that uh, like, is he saying anything wrong? Is there anything factually inaccurate in what Ali is saying, apart from asking if a really famous K-pop band is a Japanese comic book? You, is there anything else? I'll, I'll, I'll second that theory because have you noticed how you would meet a lot of uh, degenerates in every ethnicity? So you'd meet like white people, brown people, whoever they may be, um, who were like really smart, and then you see them like ten years later. They're not that smart. Mm. They probably got into like I don't know weed or some shit. Mm. Never happens with Asians. Well, they because can't. they're it's cyborgs. Illegal. Yes, they keep, sorry, they yeah, get cyborgs. better with yes, time. Right. The more data that they take in, the better they get. <laughs> Every day's an upgrade. <laughs> Every day. Every an day for us is a downgrade. All right, so let me look for uh, James. Did he send us anything? I think that in the end, it will be a good thing. That this happened because America needed a shameful moment to wake up some of those on the right. That is not our opinion. That is thank not you for our playing opinion. though, James, and thank you for listening to this podcast. I'm assuming right until we give our opinion on the riot. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> Maybe this will cause a riot within our audience, but then again, they have stuck around for a lot of defending China. So <laughs> <laughs> now we've got a <laughs> revolving. Bad, but hey. China doesn't put up with this shit. Actually, I got a Patreon message what? yesterday. It was a private message. Some guy just said, okay, listen, there's no one here. I just want to know. Are you guys actually pro-China? <laughs> <laughs> what was your response? Oh, it was such a coded one as well. Uh, it was like, um, <laughs> and I kind of answered on your behalf, with my opinion. It was uh, something like um, recognizing an incompetent uh it was like something super philosophical that could be like co- uh, interpreted in different ways. But mm. basically I said, uh, uh, not recognizing strengths of an imperfect system is idiotic. Being pro any system completely without critical analysis is also dumb. Yes. I'm dumb in the second category though. I am <laughs> uncritical. <laughs> Which is why I said, I, I said in my opinion, um, <laughs> AI taking over the world eventually. I saw this. Have you seen that um, Chinese or Asian game? That's like way more intelligent than chess. I can't remember what the name is, but they're basically like checkers. Five-way checkers. Oh. Is it Chinese checkers? Yeah, I Chinese think that is checkers, what it is. But it, it's called, but they recently, be, so, the, uh, so the Chinese and Asia, whoever plays that game takes pride on the fact that 
unlike any other game, this game is super creative because the possibilities are endless. Oh wait, are you talking about Mahjong? Yeah, I think I'm talking about. Looks that. like dominoes. Yeah. Yeah. They were saying how the possibilities are endless, and it's a super creative game. Um, which is why you know how like they formed computers that could beat human uh, like uh, professional chess players yeah, in the eighties. In the eighties, right? They couldn't do that for this game. Yeah. Until recently, when the Korean heavyweight, who is their version, this guy who plays a board game, is more famous than Brad Pitt in in Korea. Whoa! Uh, in in Korea and China. Mo in Korea is a household name. Anyways, recently they came out. Some British company came out with an AI um, software that beat him, and that made every South Korean in the world cry really, really loud. Yeah, and so it would because if I was alive for when Deep Blue won uh, against the Russian, I'm assuming it was. Mm. Man, that is a sadder moment for human history than like a. Uh, Actually, not, not no, momentous. It's more momentous than the Berlin Wall collapsing. Wait, what was more momentous? The chess. Just the fact that there was this massive IBM computer sitting there going like, night to D5, checkmate. Yeah. Everyone would have held their breath at that point. Because I'm assuming Terminator must have just come out like the year before that. Yeah. And then they thought, damn, this is Skynet with one completely useless function. You know the other thing that I noticed, which made me kind of scared of AI. Not only is AI super intelligent, that it is, but the other thing that AI has, you could find a man that would be able to beat that AI machine. But the problem is, we are all humans. We always talk about like humans are different because we have creativity. The other thing that humans have is fucking they co we collapse under pressure, mm. like all of us. So mm. while I was watching this like grand live broadcasted. AI versus Korean smartest Marshall man in man. the world. The one thing that I noticed very clearly was, first of all, the AI would take 10 minutes to do a move because just computing the entire information. And during that entire 10 minutes, the Korean mastermind is just sweating because like, he's a human. Pressure. The, the pressure is insane. And the AI- yeah, The AI, AI wasn't, doesn't, no pressure, none. It can't, it doesn't know pressure. That in itself is something that will make it like, infinitely better than us. Yeah, program sweating into it. Can you imagine like, uh, for example, any professional sport, if you could get that level of calm headedness, you just win everything. Mm. Most of the time you collapse on Maybe not if you shit at the sport, but yeah, I see where you're coming <laughs> from. There's, there, there still have to be some variability of skill involved. Because you know when people are always saying that, the ch golf is a 90% mind game. No, it's not. It's not. There's no, having never played ch golf in my entire life. But I can safely assume that 90% of it isn't just being like, okay, mind like the wind. Oh, okay, hole in one. Never done it in my entire life. There we go. Perfect game. I <laughs> like, I don't think that that computer program, as soon as you just put a hand in it, it goes, that, that, that wouldn't be the result. Well, the stupid thing doesn't have hands. It only has lights. Oh um, yeah, Wait, so what happens? Who moves it then? Oh well, do they have some just, official <laughs> adjudicator? Yeah, there's another Asian guy who's sitting there, <laughs> <laughs> who just moves it. Who was also who was way more nervous <laughs> after the match. He was like, I was so nervous. Like, you don't have to do shit. You just have to replicate the thing that the AI machine did. Well, what about that grandmaster? What does he do now? Just wallows in pity. Well, he, maybe he killed I mean, himself. He cries. He cries a lot. He, you could tell how it was such a, because you could also tell that he's never lost a match in his entire life. <sighs> but even, yeah, I was just trying to put myself in his shoes. That would be sad. Yeah, and and apparently, like with all the news, like uh, the press briefings afterwards, they kept saying how like incredibly depressed he is. Yeah, after losing, because he, he lost surely he would be five matches, five zero. Yeah. <laughs> Even more depressed than Sai was when his uh, much anticipated follow up to Gundam style gentleman came out and he got nowhere near as many views. <laughs> the two saddest Korean that men is on earth. Incredibly also, the golf reminds me. You know how you told me ages ago, like maybe in um, 2016 or something, you told me how if you do anything, anything for 10,000 hours, yeah. you will be the fucking best at it. Yes, you will. Right? So that theory comes from, like the biggest example is Tiger Woods. Mm. Tiger Woods was just basically handed a club when he was 
a fucking infant mm. by his dad and he's like you mm. keep playing there's like no option mm. you just keep doing it and he ended up being like the greatest golfer ever and also the fact that he's half black half asian <laughs> now that is a formula to success of just being really athletic and really good at concentrating <laughs> But the uh, but the thing that I recently read, which disputes that, is that they were saying that the worst sport that you could choose to confirm this is golf. So the idea is that that is on that ten thousand or whatever fifteen thousand hour theory is only relevant when every time you face an issue, it's like every time you face the same set of probabilities. So like things like golf, where like there's eighteen hole, everyone has to put it in that hole. The 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 competition who gets to do it first. Or things like even chess, where there's a board and the probabilities are all, they're always the same. The chess board doesn't change every match. They were saying that for competitive sports, like particularly team sports like uh, soccer, rugby, cricket, and all of that, that is the worst thing you can do. In fact, most of the greatest players of those games are the ones that when they were younger, when they were like uh, between the ages of 10 to 15 almost, they were playing every sport that they could get their hands on. Like they were just like sporty kids. It was usually after the age of 15 when they choose that one sport and they keep going at it. Because what the guy was, what the research was arguing was that um, in any match situation like soccer, you're given every time you go out there, there's a different set of uh, play makes. Or you need to be way more creative in those situations. And if you, do, if you just practice 10,000 hours, you will never be the best at it. You also need to be creative. Being a polymath in one specific subject. Yeah. Well, for any subject, like for any other sport, this was like relevant to sport. So I'm just saying that 10,000 hours theory may be relevant for a handful of sports. It still sounds like it's relevant though. It's just, you have to put the 10,000 hours into different skills. Initially. Well, I guess the, the, the theory is like you have to put 8,000 hours and you put 2,000 hours in different sports. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, but it's still this kind of thing of like, look, even if you are playing tennis and you're playing soccer, there's still an overlap there. No, well, I think you need practice for every sport. Like without practice, you can't be great at any sport but there's this specific theory right that but you, you can be the best at something if you put in this amount of effort into it yeah you well, you will probably be really good at it but you you might not be the best at it i think it reminds me of the fact that every time you ever hear a really good witty british comedian they're always just reading different things. I was, I was just reading a rather fascinating history of trains in Newcastle. And then before that, I was reading about this amazing tribe in Mobutu, Africa, where their faces are on their stomach. Rather peculiar. Mm. And it's just giving yourself all of this knowledge. It's a bank. You just store a bank. It, yeah. Yeah. And you know what I'm like most afraid of? And I think it's already happening. I'm losing my bank balance, baby. Yeah, I don't think I've got a bank balance. Neither of us have bank balances. So what are we, we doing about that now? Well, I don't know what to do about it. And in fact, I would like everybody's uh, opinion. opinion on this, if you can. All right, tell us. As a comedian, and yes, I'm a comedian, I identify as a woman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cultural <laughs> homosexual. Not cultural homosexual, exactly. uh, physical woman. And I... Uh, I'm just wondering if your goal is to expand your vocabulary and have a better grasp of the English language, what would be the best thing to read? I'm thinking that it's high English literature. Everyone but pops. then if you sound like uh, Mr. Darcy, do you think that that's a good thing in today's age? I mean, there's a lot of outdated words that you wouldn't be using. And I mean, the fact that your dad, as a regular expression, doesn't use something like uh, one by a nose hair or something <laughs> yeah. like that he uses. That would be like shipping coal to Newcastle. Yeah, he, he if you went to Newcastle, everyone would say, what the fuck does that mean? There's no coal there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's like and it hasn't been for like 150 <laughs> years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, look, he, like, there hasn't been coal there for twice as long as that man's been alive. You, you need to you need to realize that until my dad was fifty years old, 
he was mentally still living in 1917 October Revolution. <laughs> like yeah. That, that, that's the zone that he was in. <laughs> so even English literature at the time was, uh, there was coal in Newcastle yeah. back then. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, look, we're going to go on a break. We'll come back with the main podcast. And uh, when we come back, you guys need to tell us, how do we fill that bank again? Yeah. Is it just Here traveling? It Anyways, well- I'm not doing fucking pub trivia. <laughs> we'll all right, see, see you in two minutes. Welcome to an all new episode of the Friendly Geordies podcast. Where we were asking everybody, what do you do to expand your vocabulary? And the overall answer I think that we got was read any book other than Tony Robbins. I, I don't know if I'm ready for that commitment just yet. I think I need to read, <laughs> reread on giant shoulders, not Awake at the Giant Within, the shortened version that just has all the condensed quotes that you could easily read by just going to the front of every chapter. There is too much wisdom there. I think there's enough for everything. Yeah, look, let's be honest. Lao Tzu's The Tao Te Ching was the widest, wisest book until Unlimited Power, the power of putting on pants in the morning. Dude, I am, I, I need, this needs to happen. When are you going to a Tony Robbins show? I told you that I tried to the other day, right? I tried to go to his business mastery seminar now online. Oh yeah, how did it, well. Uh, well. I think that we all know the answer to that because I'm not gushing about it and I haven't increased my business by a guaranteed 30 to 70%. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't go. And you know why? Because there's just a questionnaire but pretty much just saying, okay, let's just see if you qualify to go into business mastery. Are you a CEO of OPEC? No. Better luck next time. <laughs> I'm not interested. No, like he just, he, he, apparently you have to be a, isn't this incredible? When you see that stadium of people that are yelling and gushing over Tony Robbins, you know who's in there? Like Bill Clinton and Prince Charles, just the absolute elite of the planet. It's 10,000 of the richest human beings on earth. Do you know what he And is? that's his Mick Jagger concert. He's modern day Rasputin. Um... I am failing to grasp any parallel whatsoever what between Tony about? Robbins and Rasputin, but go on. Hey, come on, look. Billionaires hang out with Ra uh, billionaires hang out with Tony Robbins. Yeah, but there was like three. Czar hung out with Rasputin. Exactly, that's it. That was all they had was just the royal family and he hung out with them. So you're just saying that because Tony Robbins might have shook hands with Prince William once, He's Prince the same. William's wife has a thing for Tony Robbins. Yeah. Czar's wife had a thing for Rasputin. <laughs> Come on, the parallels are just there. And also, this is the other thing that I, I think you're failing to notice here. Tony Robbins looks more manly than Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Rasputin looks like a rat with a beard. He's got to be manly. the ugliest sex symbol in human history. Rasputin gets assassinated. Tony, Tony Robbins, Robbins question we'll mark. Get assassinated. <laughs> <laughs> by you for not increasing your business by 50%. Well, yeah, right, because I couldn't just press the refund button. But they were saying that, uh, yeah, it looked, it looked incredible, I've got to say. He walks into some Hollywood 3D studio. It's just green screens around him. And it's kind of like this extremely corporate 1984 with all the telescreens. He just walks in going, yeah. And then there's just 10,000 billionaires on Skype. Like, yeah, Tony. And he's just like, are you ready to master your business? Stop drinking Coke. That's terrible for you. Let's get down to business. So he's just seeing everybody in real time and, and clicking them up on a little screen. And I was just thinking, damn, the technology on six day was on point. Mm. Wait, it was a six day thing? No, 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 the movie Six the Day. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. I was <laughs> like, in case was anybody like... on earth has seen that film other than me and my Wait, godfather. Wait, no, that's the Arnold movie, right? Yeah, the Arnold movie that I don't think anybody's watching. Surely that must have been a flop. <laughs> no, I really don't think that anybody can explain to me the storyline of it, even though you, you can say it in uh, like a couple of words, I reckon. It's just pretty much twins, but they're not twins, they're clones. Mm. You know Wouldn't it be amazing if Artis Walshinger's clone was Danny DeVito again? <laughs> he was just like, wow, it's just like looking in a mirror. By the way, guess what was playing on SBS? Uh, not SBS, sorry, Channel Go. Ah, oh, okay. Definitely right. not SBS. A few days ago, Twins, I saw that shit again. And you know what? It's still fucking awesome. But have you noticed this about Twins? 
Danny DeVito does not enhance that film at all. It's just Arnold Schwarzenegger saying things like, excuse me, can you tell me where Third Street is? That's the joke. The parts where he's just saying serious dialogue. You know what the, that's it. Do you know what the entire the, uh, the appeal of that movie was? That a man of a stature of uh, Danny DeVito <laughs> was the alpha <laughs> in that relationship. Oh, was that that point, was, was I think that was the interesting bit. Like that Danny DeVito was this like controlling guy and this massive giant of a man was subservient to him. Yes, classic Hollywood dynamics playing around. Ooh, and you thought they only started doing that in the late teens. <laughs> no, they were doing it back at Twids Day. But it was a revolutionary movie in a lot of ways because it was the first time that two actors said, we'll do this movie, but we want to cut for it. In fact, really, it's such a half-assed <laughs> story. It was just Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger si- sitting into each other and they go, ha, you're really short and I'm really tall. We didn't need to be funny if we made a movie where we were twins. And so we went to a Hollywood director. And oh, so it's it just that classic idea. hack story of Hollywood, how you imagine it works. Yeah. And somebody just comes in with the next Schindler's List and there's someone going, yeah, just throwing around a globe ball in his hand lazily. And then Arnold Schwarzenegger comes around and goes, look, look, we look different. But imagine if we were twins. You've done it again. And but so they get a green wrong. light. He's not wrong. <laughs> Everyone thinks he's stupid, but he's actually really smart. <clears throat> Who? Arnold. He's an incredibly smart man. Yeah, of course he is. Like the fact that he, he, we think it's stupid. I'm really tall. You're really short. We can be in a movie. It'll be a blockbuster. Again, funny, but is he wrong? Look, as the box office has clearly shown, no. Right? But <laughs> Was it a successful one? It has Unbelievably, to be. especially for them, because they put into it, yeah, but we just want royalties. And they asked for a ridiculous amount of royalties each. <laughs> I can't remember what it was, but say it was 30% each or something. So it, it is the great, most yeah. profitable movie he's ever done. He gets pretty much a friend's check every year just from twins and let's just keep it by Arnold Schwarzenegger has been in some of the most memorable movies of the 20th century right mm-hmm. it, Jesus Christ how much money does that guy get every year you know those stupid celebrity net worths where it's just like it's rumoured that Arnold Schwarzenegger is worth 15 million dollars <laughs> I don't think that's true I think he's worth more 20 million <laughs> yeah, 20 million <laughs> I think he just gets a 20 million dollar check just from tweets the other thing that I recently read which was funny that apparently uh, at the peak of his career like Terminator had just come out he sees he uh, during like the Iraq uh, Gulf War he's watching TV and he says he sees those Humvees going about about to go and attack and take over and he's like I want one of those so he goes to Hummer and he says, I want one of those. And they're like, no, nah, we can't give because they're, they, you military can't register. Grade. These are military. Like, you won't, they're not legal to drive. He's like, I don't care. <laughs> I want one of those. And apparently he had, his charisma was so strong that the CEO was like, I guess we're making consumer ones now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how Hummers actually were launched in the market. Really? They were, it was at Arnold's request. He what, bought, like so these were during the Gulf War, right? Yeah, this was during the Gulf War. Hummers were just Yeah, uh, peak Arnold, ninety one. Yeah, exclusively military uh stuff and they were available they're now available for consumers because of Arnold. He just wanted one. And then he did this other thing where he kept those Humvees for eight years and then people started um uh Humvees became one of those uh cars Collect that items. Well, no, no, well, they were collector's item, but it also received a lot of bad rep for being gas guzzling machines and responsible for climate change. And right? rightfully so, I would imagine as well. <laughs> Can you imagine how much it takes to power one of those things? It pretty much is Howl's moving castle. Yeah, they are. They are gas guzzling machines. But you know what Arnold did? Mm. <laughs> he went to the shop and before, way before Tesla, he was like, make all of these electric. <laughs> <laughs> And so he made each and every Hummer of his electric. And then he comes on TV, right? And I'm not paraphrasing this. I've seen this live. He says, like, this is how you solve climate change. You just convert your Hummers into electric ones. Problem solved. Do the same. This <laughs> 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 fucked up story. Like, He's kind of right, though. It probably, it probably does emit as much as Australia does. Hummers. Yeah, but, like, not every, no one owns a Hummer, dude. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> Well, I thought every rapper and wealthy gadabout kid in Vol Clues owns a Hummer. 
They used to. Apparently, Hummers are now uh, falling in sales because of that reason. No, who'd you guess? <laughs> yeah, look, look, I think the, the most cunt move I've ever seen in my life is, you remember where the Dome Kang lived? Yeah. And how it was a one-way street in Paddington? Yeah. I saw someone driving a Hummer on that street. Oh, Jesus. That, that, <laughs> like, I remember walking with the Dome King and saying, what an asshole!" And the woman across the road, no one ever speaks to anyone in Paddington. That's how momentous it was. It was just like, it's unbelievable, isn't it? And it was because it was just like all terrain going over the dry, uh, the, the footpath of Paddington to get to where it needed to go. Just smooshing French bulldogs left and right just to get down the street. What is up with Aussies not giving a fuck about shit like that? They get a house in Paddington and they also get a Hummer. I was driving and I was about to, I needed to park my car in front of my friend's house. And I'm kidding you not, his house, in front of his house was like this massive Land Cruiser, right? But that's fine because that's just a car. But behind that Land Cruiser is, is attached an entire fucking yacht. It's not like one of those small boats, but an entire fucking huge Wolf Street, ass one. Wolf of Wall Street. And he's parked it on the street. Yeah, that's like, Aussie. Dude, this is not okay. <laughs> you block the entire <laughs> street. if you're a plumber. There's a yacht over here. <laughs> but dude, you live in the Western suburbs. You're probably the only person that doesn't have a boat. Dude, I had to explain to my brother how that's not okay. Like, cause he <sighs> wanted to get a jet ski or he wanted to get, and I was like, look, I know I'm happy that you're making some money, but like, <laughs> You no, <laughs> like we don't have any space for our cars, and honestly speaking, I just don't like the aesthetic for fucking jet ski parked on my driveway. Yeah, straight yeah, up, yeah, even yeah, if yeah, we yeah. had infinite space. No, I, it's a good choice. I cannot associate with that. No, it's too westy, and there's something else that's extremely western suburbs about it, which is using it precisely twice. You're never gonna use a jet ski. Yeah, Let's be honest, you especially your brother. I can't tell the difference between him and a couch. <laughs> He's not going to be motivated enough to get a jet ski out. Where is the closest water to your That's house? That's what it's I'm probably saying. two hours away. That was away. my other point. I was like, dude, the closest beach is 50 minutes away, and uh -huh. that beach sucks balls. Like, <laughs> it's, it's probably closer to go to Lithgow Dam. <laughs> it's like, so far. Yeah. Which beach is it? The Sands? Uh, maybe the Cronulla one. Yeah, that beach does suck balls. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's noticed this yet, but going to a beach where you can see a desalination plant, <laughs> there's got to be better ones in Australia. That can't be. Th this there is are. not Santosa <laughs> in Singapore. Yeah, okay, that's that's the top of the line. No, is it? actually, I, I take that back. Like the, you, you got to give this country the, like the beaches are incredible. <laughs> well, <laughs> even I as a joke, I can't say it yeah, for too yeah, long. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, look, when your friend took us to that Pakistani beach. And just being like, hey, man, do you want to see where the cool kids go? I didn't know if he was joking or not. I, yeah, I, I know. Like, it, it, the, the, the seawall in Blade Runner 2049 looked less environmentally fucked yeah. than that beach. The, the two sad, is there anything there? There's two saddest beaches in the world. Is One is that, and the other one's in the Gaza Strip. <laughs> oh, is that really? No kid is playing on that beach. <laughs> it's is any kid playing on the Pakistan one? Well, you know what's the other thing? That beach is famous. In fact, like if you're from Karachi, the the tell that you are like from there is that if you've never been to that beach, because that beach sucks so much. So only people that actually go to the beach are the ones that come from different cities and like regional, just basically pov cunts. Yeah, look, not to be too down on your country because I think as, uh, as, as anyone would know that it frequents this podcast, I never say anything mean about Pakistan or Ali's Pakistani heritage ever. <laughs> I'm a true peach when it comes to that. Yeah, he's, he, he's a real politically <laughs> correct guy. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that though, uh, uh, fuck India, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, is there a nice beach in Pakistan? There is. Actually, there's there's a few really nice beaches, but the problem with those beaches are that they are in Baluchistan, mm. which is that like- That is a uh, problem. Which is like basically our wild, wild west. So And that should have a desalination plant, but they're too pov to have one. But their water is really clear because uh, there's only two people shitting over there. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's actually really pristine. Oh, look, uh, Western Australia beaches are the best in the world. Like. To most most people from like most countries, I would say it's one of the the some of the best looking beaches. But Baluchistan's banging. 
It's crazy. It's it's really really pretty. But the problem is that the roads are really shit. There used to be a security problem. Like um, you couldn't go there back in the day because there were just insurgencies everywhere. Now that problem has decreased a little bit. But now the problem is there's no fucking road there. Yep. Because that is a pickle. Every Unless time. you're Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. in a Hummer. <laughs> That's why you need a Hummer. <laughs> but unfortunately in Pakistan, there's not much electricity. So <laughs> he's still stuck with everyone else. Dude, apparently, you know, there's this controversy <laughs> going on. After a long time, there was a terrorist attack over there in Balochistan. Mm. And uh, these like uh, 10 Shia coal miners were killed. And uh, so when they were killed, they, they refused to bury their dead because what they wanted was the prime minister of the country, Imran Khan, to come over. And uh, I don't know, I guess just say, oh, well, that sucks. Um, and Did he? <laughs> dude, this, it got insane. Because initially they were like, come. And so like they weren't burying their bodies. like, the, and, and they were like slightly rotting. And then apparently Imran Khan was really busy. So he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Just bury them and I'll come. And they were like, no, we're not going to bury them until you come. Dude, Imran Khan apparently flips out. He just goes like, stop fucking blackmailing me. <laughs> And like the whole liberal news media <laughs> would, went bizarre. They're like, all they want is a shoulder to cry yeah, on. And you say, <laughs> um, it worked though. They ended up burying their dead and then he went there. Oh my God. God, and people think that these capital riots are bad. <laughs> this is just what the prime minister has to deal with yeah. in Pakistan. So yeah, That's one of these lighter days. <laughs> yeah. that, that probably is the least most complicated problem that man has faced. It's a tough it gig. Is, it's, it's a, a tough, tough gig. gig. Also, just before we go on to the Capitol Hill riots, I also have to ask this. Ali, why does your middle class particularly suck? I um, remember that where we went to your version of the Swiss Alps, which was lovely, except for the people that were there. There was just something really obnoxious about them. I would look, I, I agree with you, but I would argue that middle class is everywhere. They do. Fucking annoying. They do, but there was shit. something really fucking annoying about them. Because they weren't the middle class, they were the lower middle class. <laughs> <laughs> there was that. All right, all right. So more middle than class. Yeah, because they're all like, uh, they're city fucks. So uh, if you're part of the, if you live in like an area and you're like lower class, you end up keep keeping your area clean. But these city lower middle class fucks come over and they start throwing shit. So they're just like, they're basic. You know what they are <laughs> in Australia? Yeah. Them, they became like slightly more richer. Basically, they're cr people that live in the Shire. It's yeah. basically the same people. Yeah. The difference is people yeah. in the Shire now have slightly more money. Mm. But you know how they're annoying and they keep shit like a fucking massive uh, boat in front of their uh, driveway? Mm. That's Australian equivalent of the annoying middle class in Pakistan. But what's their equivalent of the boat? When do they have donkeys? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's what's their? Oh, you know what? This what? is and, and you'll hate them more for this. Every one of those uh, Hajj Eats where you sacrifice animals, they do it on the fucking street. How is that middle class? That well, because you can afford the animal. Yeah, well, yeah. Lower classes <laughs> cannot. Lower classes are the ones that are like waiting for that meat. And but you know they're even more annoying because <laughs> these middle so class people have, they just the point of those sacrifices is that you give it away to poor people. But they got big ass deep freezers now. <laughs> so, they, so they just like stock up. That's their entire shtick. Well, your analysis is correct. I'll never forget this. I think it was the reason that I have maintained a long friendship with you, Ali, is once when you came to my house, you just said, man, I've been thinking about something for quite a while and I think I'm ready to say it. The middle class sucks ass. The and you couldn't sum it up better than that. The middle class. do. And... As, as members of it, I think we're perfectly entitled to say it. I think that millennials suck, and I think that the middle class sucks. And I think that Zoomers suck, and I know that I'm going to get a lot of heat about this, especially online. Well, you think Zoomers suck? I, I think they're like starting them. to rot. And you know what the difference <laughs> is? You know why they started going manky, like those decapitated goat bodies on the sides of Pakistan? Mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson's not around to set him straight anymore. I swear. He's back. He's back, but he's not back with a vengeance. Mm. He's back in a mild comatose, and he doesn't have the omnipotence that he had before. And did you know what? Uh, it every is? Zoomer that I was speaking to, when they used to have memes of Jordan Peterson around and stuff, there was a lot less cuckdom 
that you see in our generation and they were kind of smug about the fact that millennials had that uh, that, that, that kind of like cucky flavour to them but now they're just a one unity ticket and now I just see them and I think you are exactly the same except for instead of working in PR you're getting a degree in PR that's that's the only difference now do you know what I'm perfectly honest about this you know what I've noticed about Zoomers and I've recently hung out with a few Zoomers and I think this is a serious problem. This is something that we used to talk about our generation and saying, oh, this is going to go to shit. Zoomers have very, very small attention spans. Yep. That's why they like TikTok. Mm-hmm. TikTok is way too small. They the damn phones. I'm not saying that they're stupid. Some of them would be smart. They would like... Yeah, but they're smart in 15 second yes, fractions. They are which is not inverse. long enough to be smart. <laughs> yeah, that's not long enough to be smart. You know what's long enough to be smart? A decade. Yeah. There's a bit of a difference between 15 seconds and 10 years. True. That's, in fact, I recommend this. Everybody's telling me to stop reading Tony Robbins. And first of all, suggestion noted and put straight rejected. into the <laughs> trash in my mind. Noted and rejected. <laughs> but there's another book called Deep Work. And I highly recommend everybody out there read it. Because the overall essential thesis of it is that there is a massive skill shortage uh, as a result of all of these uh, TikToks and MSNs and so everybody is now skillless there are generations now that do not have skills as in there's a lot of kids that put all of their attention into Call of Duty and now they're 32 and they don't have degrees and even if they do have degrees they're bad at it and so there's very few people that have been able to pry themselves away from the phone. Which, speaking of, let me just see if you guys agree with this. But that is something that I highly recommend to everybody, especially if you're young, read now. You need to start really instilling into your mind that you paying attention is now the most valuable asset there is. Always has been. Always has been people that have... But the difference before was that people couldn't afford to sit around and read books. But now you can easily afford to do that. Yeah. It's called having parents. <laughs> and so th- they are your ingles now. Well, they might just be bad books, though. Like, hmm? some parents are really not the good model to base your life on. Are you saying just re- just just talk to your parents in as a replacement no, of Christ, books? No, 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 no. I'm saying ignore your parents, but take advantage of the free rent yeah, yeah. and just live in their house. And every time they say, do you want dinner? Just go, I told you, Yes. And then go back to studying. But also just like- It's pretty much just staying at a library with a really annoying waiter that gives you free food. But you know, like you can get out of it. It's basically if 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 everyone follows your um, landlord's uh, advice on things. Mm. Jordan's landlord has some, and this might sound kind of stupid, but it is, it's, it's really, really good advice. He says that every day of your life, irrespective of what, you need to take out 20 minutes, just 20 minutes, and read a book. The other thing that he says, like sometimes people don't have like enough attention spans or they get bored by reading books. Even if it's not making sense to you, sometimes you'd be like, you'd be reading, you've read five pages and you're like, I don't even know what I read. Keep going. Because on the 15th page, you will start understanding it. Because your your mind is trained to focus on things. It's just that it wouldn't do it unless you wanted to do it. You know what? That is one of the most sage pieces of advice that you gave that I promptly ignored because it came from you. Yeah. And so it was just like, yeah, yeah. Cool, and, man, avoid, weed or- and avoid brunettes on Tinder. Those two advices. Brunettes? <laughs> yeah. Why? No. no, go for them too. <laughs> They're all right. I'm kidding. <laughs> what? Well, just you just decided to throw them under the bus for no reason. Yeah, for nothing. No reason whatsoever. Okay, I can't say to do it. with anything. We had a little Tinder <laughs> chat beforehand. Now that's on record. Well done. Hope you get clear. Well, I couldn't say don't date blondes because, like, what's the point of Tinder then? Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. What is the point of Tinder other than that? Also, uh, do you know? Do you know why I think? Because some people were mentioning this too. It comes back to our original point. Do you know why? Like, um, Jordan Peterson's lost a little bit of steam. Mm. Wait, are people saying that, are they? Well, no, just like you mentioned it and I mentioned it. I think people yeah. are saying that as well. They were talking about like, yeah, uh, I think it's because his bank's depleted. Because if you think about it, and I suffer, I've suffered through this as well. Um, Jordan Peterson, for like what, however old he was, let's say he was 53 before he got famous, right? For 53 years, he kept building on that bank. He was reading shit. He was understanding stuff. And he had no one to fucking communicate that to. 
all of a sudden he gets really big so his ideas are worth something he starts putting them out and because he has like 50 years of training about it, it just it it was it was really good fire hose now it's been two to three years and i think he's been sick right he's been like super yeah he had like addiction issues yeah. too he was basically he became a heroin addict He's, his bank's depleted. That's all that's happened. Yeah, but I think his bank is depleted because half of his brain is missing now. What? That's what I'm saying. When you look at him, he looks like Homer in Bart's imagination when he gets a lobotomy and he accidentally breaks a vase and Homer's sitting there drooling saying, that's all right, son. That's what's looking at Jordan Peterson now. So it's really hard to sell yourself as the most prominent intellectual in the world, the guy that needs a bib. So, <laughs> so that, that's not funny. <laughs> well, yeah, I've, I've, I feel bad about it, but sometimes all you can do is laugh. Well, that's a real shame because it he is was a real a good, shame. He, yeah, he was like a good right wing intellectual. But I think that the reason that he was is not because his bank is depleted. What was really fascinating about him is he sits in that small community of people that have really grey jobs, like being an academic or being a politician. There's very few people in these fields and the only ones that spring to mind really are Paul Keating and Jordan Peterson that are also clearly creative. He's very good at just getting two ideas and mashing them together and making them come out in a surprising way and keeping an audience enraptured. He reminds me of just the greatest storyteller in the Middle Ages that would go from town to town for bread. Mm. But now you've got access to every human being on earth giving you their little pittance. So now you're a multi, multi-millionaire for the same uh, product. But th there's, there's very few orators in life that are able to combine those two things together, which is non-fiction and fiction. True. Don't and you think? And that's a true skill. Do you, know, do you know how you get that? My dad used to always say this, and this is something that I lack. I don't, he says, you've got to read non-fiction and you've got to read fiction. Yeah, and I don't do it. Yeah. Actually, everybody in the comments, do you think that it's worth reading fiction? And if it is, tell us some of the books that are there. And I don't want to hear any of this fucking... Um, War and Peace. Emily Roder or whatever her name is. Jane Austen. Jane Austen I don't want to hear anything about. Goodbye. I've read enough books about them just sitting around this specific table <laughs> saying, are you going to play cards or not, Emily? Well, it's most unconventional that you don't. But, uh, no, what was it? Yeah, em Del Toro's Quest. <laughs> If anybody um, has any fond memories of Del Toro's quest, I've just got to say, I politely disagree. <laughs> so, Marlene says 1984. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read that. Uh, nice suggestion, Marlene. Have you heard of this book uh, before? But I just did read it recently, and yes, spot on. It is actually... And you know what? It's a lot better reading 1984 after reading Manufacturing Consent because there's just this myth that keeps getting perpetuated that 1984 didn't happen because guess what we're past 1984 and there is no Oceania well there is on a map and so everybody thinks that Brave New World is the more likely dystopia but the underlying message of 1984 which is what I think that nobody understands is just an over exaggeration of the kind of age that we are living in now which is pure control of information so there is a lot to glean from reading 1984 after reading Manufacturing Consent and also the Noam Chomsky of our times. Tucker Carlson, who actually does, really could work on big tech. Yeah. He's, he's holding him to account. The, I think the only the thing that about 1984 is that even though it was, um, it, was, uh, um, it was about the Soviet Union... I don't most, know if it was. This is the whole... Well, I think it's I'm more relevant to it, like... Uh, capitalist countries now. It's that kind of like sophisticated country. big brother shit like post uh, Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, it applies to like us more than... Because in Russia, they know. And also their technology is bad. So when you're getting tapped, you can actually hear it on the phone. You are being tapped. <laughs> you are being tapped. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing that's how it is. But not, not happening in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Putin, are you on the line? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, no, that's true. And I was making this point on the Neil and Jordan podcast, a little preview. In yeah. fact, this entire conversation is I'm just having the same conversation except for instead of with an Indian, with a Pakistani, <laughs> to show you everybody hey, that we're not podcast. so different after all. Check out Neil and Jordan podcast too if you haven't. It's a really good one. I, I listen to it all the time. Do you? I uh, No. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. When I can, I do. It's good. It's a good one. Check it out. 
Yeah, well, you would be somebody to ask that about because I don't. But I don't listen to any of the podcasts. I don't like seeing myself on tape. I know, I don't either. But like, I but the thing about it is, is I have to during editing or it's just it's good to know up. if you suck or not. So mm, I have yeah, to, yeah, yeah. I have yeah. to do it. Um. All right. Anyways, let's move on to the main topic, which is oh well, yeah. Forty let me just minutes in, segue into that main topic by saying I was making this point on Neil. There's a brilliant point that I missed in 1984 reading it the first time. And if you can't be bothered, because when I'm saying reading, I was listening to it in an audio book uh, on the way down to Narendra with Miss. And Miss was really into it as well. But there was this guy. And what a boss. He just listens to a lot of audio books and he's that same British voice that is undeniably a very proficient voice at doing this voiceover, but when you're trying to do 20 different characters, it sounds very monotonous, and there's very little <laughs> difference between that and an online car review on BBC. And so it doesn't work. They, they don't have enough range. And so it just gets a bit monotone when you're reading a 20-hour book. Uh, this guy has amazing v variation in tonality. And he just started reading out audiobooks and set up a Patreon. And he's so much better. And he puts in all the sound effects and all the whiz bang shenanigans that you expect in a radio play. He's combined the two. He's done it the madman. And I wish I could shout him out, but I can't. But there's that version of 1984 uh, on YouTube. It's got nothing really to do with what I was saying, but he, because he's just so good at drawing you into it. He makes you notice all of these little subtle points that George Orwell was saying that you kind of just glean over when you're reading and think like, yeah, yeah, Kmart's got a pretty good deal. Oh, fuck, I'm reading a book. And you go back to paying attention. There was one point that everybody always says that in 1984, the interesting point that I always thought was a bit lame was that the war may or may not be happening between the, the all of them they're kind of just wasting resources and and pooling it all so they can just fight over this nether region that nobody actually wants to win it's just there to destroy resources to keep everybody impoverished and feel like there's a constant external threat yeah. that always seemed fairly basic to me but there was this other little point that suggests that actually what was happening was that there was just a few professional forces in this nether region and they would come in and have quick little skirmishes, film it, and then send that footage back to their respected mega countries as propaganda. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that's a much more interesting point, that the war itself is being manufactured and it's kind of just almost a sport in their world against, uh, against like a, a couple of competing forces that's used for a bigger purpose. I swear that's what happens now uh, with how riots are manipulated in the US. And you can go deeper into this, but just as a little pretext to what we're saying now, uh, Ali has been divulging some serious truth bombs that are more deadly than real bombs, yo, because information is real power. Bombs are pretty powerful too. And I think that if you combine those two ideas together, it really gives you an interesting glean into what's happening now. And just off air before we go on, and then you can just go on to your little spiel. What we were saying before is the older you get, the more you look at politics like a chessboard. I can't be bothered with the moralizing anymore. Mm. You just get to a point where you sit there and go, mm, nice move, you know? Yeah. And Trump is deep blue. <laughs> well, uh, deep red. I learned something some time ago that moralizing, even if that's something that motivates you, is never really a great argument. So it's it's, it's not something that you should bring out. Yeah. Even though it might be relevant, but just avoid it. There's, yeah. there's no point in like guilting someone. Um, dude. Okay. So uh, the riots. The riots were the riots were pretty. The riots were insane, and I had. But I had. Thing, the, do you think they were? Well, now I think that they, actually now I think they're they're a lot less insane. Cause yeah. initially what I, what I assumed was that there were um, the, the the Trump base, rural Midwestern folks. I mean, all of this is true. Came to protest, and uh, and just realized that they could overwhelm Capitol Hill, 
And uh, they had like thousands of people behind them. There weren't that many police officers, so they fucking went for it. And they went inside. And um, by the time the police came in, like you know, it was all over the news. So it was just one of those unfortunate events that happened because there was lack of security, and um, and and the Capitol Hill's police couldn't predict that it could get that bad. That's what I assumed happened. But as things get revealed slowly, I'm realizing, oh fuck. This is something completely different. I completely missed this. Okay, so I'll preface this by, and I told Jordan this. I was reading a New York Times article. There's this guy, I can't remember his name. Uh, he, um, he worked under the Obama administration and around um, uh, late 2000s and mid uh, 2010s, he was tossed on, um, he was an academic and he was tossed on making a model to predict when third world countries will collapse. Usually when you say when third world countries would collapse, you mean a civil war, because usually that's how uh, states collapse. There's a power vacuum and people start fighting with each other. So he developed a model around 2016. He, even though this model was specifically developed for third world countries, he started applying it to the US and he started realizing, oh shit, our country is fitting all of these specifications and, and he was saying that this could eventually lead to a civil war. One of the biggest factors that he had in his model to predict um, when you could move towards um, uh, a civil war was not necessarily animosity of the population, but how stratified the elites are, how business interests have been completely stratified into like their own version of uh, silos. Um, interestingly, Australia's elites or business interests are very uniform. Like our elites are not divided at all. In the US, it has gone completely insane. So when we hear things like, so today CNN, for example, was reporting some uh, company pulled out all the donations that they give to the Republican Party. And they were saying, look, business is now moving away from Republicans completely. A, f a subsect of business is moving away. Then there's another subsect of business that's completely on board. They are still want him. Anyways, so now in that background- What are the sections? Well, the, the most obvious ones are, for example, fossil fuel companies love Trump. Yeah. And they're not moving away any yeah. of their backing. Yeah. Uh, tech companies hate Trump. They will move away their backing. So the, why do they hate Trump? Um, because to them, Trump serves no purpose for them. Trump actually makes things difficult. Trump makes it harder for them to access the Chinese market. Trump makes uh, puts more regulations on shit. So that makes it harder for them. Well, don't you think that this is what's actually the big issue of our time, which is now causing civil wars? Just like the last time that there was a level of upheaval that everybody said, wow, it was just this random revolution. Because as soon as you explained this to me, I started thinking back in history and then I just realised, no, this is 100% this is right. Every time there's a revolution, there's not really, there's just two competing factions of the elites that emerge. And in the 60s, it was about the Vietnam War and it was just down the middle some of the elite wanted to be there some of the elite didn't and then when it comes to the civil war it had nothing to do with slavery it had to do with the fact that there was a free source of labor that the agricultural sector was getting that the factories were like fuck you why do i have to pay for workers yeah. that was really what was happening there so that caused the civil war the last time there was this level of our people was in the 60s and people thought it was just because you the peace revolution but that had nothing to do with it at all and so now we're here don't you think that the big issue that is causing this rift is climate change? I think that that is a major factor because you've got literally two two teams here that uh, it's harder for them to converge their interests. On one hand, there's a team that says we have control over these fossil fuels. This is our entire business and we want to sell this. And then there's another faction that's saying actually that is hampering our business projections for the future because with climate change for example, like if you've got investment property in Florida, climate change will adversely affect me. And then the other side is saying, yes, but it benefits me. <laughs> so it, you just have these, this climate change isn't the only thing that certified the elites. There's different models. So like, for example, um, the manufacturing base loves Trump because to them, to them, the idea, even though it's probably never going to happen, but people that manufacture shit like the idea that someone is putting regulations or putting in protections. Uh, whereas um, service industries like banks or Wall Street hate that 
They're like, fuck the manufacturing. Let's just keep getting all of these uh, profits from like Japan and Germany to come to Wall Street and we'll make money through this way. They just have different interests, right? So it's getting, it's getting more and more stratified. But anyways, coming uh, come to the riots, so I just wanted to give that backdrop, but the riots, what I learned was that this spontaneous riot wasn't so spontaneous actually. Mm. This, so initially, when um, after the, the fallback of the riots, when Democrats started saying, we need to impeach Trump, we need to get rid of him. I thought that was an aggressive tactic on their end. That they, they are like, this is too much. The country is going to shit. We need to make, we need, even if he has 10 days left, we need to like make an example of him by getting rid of him. I found out some other details from like news articles um, that aren't so mainstream. So, for example, I read this research. And hold that thought. I just need to check if my rice is boiling over <laughs> to be continued. Well, I'll, I'll keep going until uh, you I'll t- until you do it. But so um, the reason why. So I read, for example, like I read this article today on um, the World Socialist website, which is I know it's socialist or whatever, but check it out. They do some good editorial stuff, too. But what we are finding out after the, uh, the fall of these riots is that organizations, institutions of the U.S., institutions like Pentagon, institutions like the police, are not unanimously against this stuff. There's factions within these that are very pro-Trump, and they were actively encouraging these riots. Either they were within the um, the population that was doing the riot, so they were like active military men that were part of that. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about people behind the scenes. So for example, um, Nancy Pelosi was contacting a lot of people during the riot saying, hey, we need help. Like I can see gra- glass breaking around me. I think I heard a gunshot. Her, her requests were ignored and ignored with a specific purpose. A lot of people in these institutions like the idea they don't they don't like uh joe biden taking over anyways so then i started thinking why are they trying to impeach him why aren't they waiting and building a case to actually try him after his presidency and put him into jail my guess is they don't want to do that democrats are shit scared of what happened they would rather that you do a symbolic thing like impeach Trump for the second time. They've done it once before. It doesn't really matter. They want to do it so that the public, people like us or like Democrat voters, feel like Trump got something, like Trump was punished for it. But in reality, they don't want to do anything because they are shit scared. Because if they pull this, if they start actually going after, like I've heard some um, low uh, like um, uh, legislator Democrats saying, why don't we use force against these people? Why don't we start killing them? Like, as in, like, why don't we start shooting them? If they're coming into Capitol Hill, let's get, let's start behaving like a police. That is a recipe for disaster. That could actually lead to a civil war. Why? Once you start, okay, imagine, imagine this scenario. These riders come in, there's ample police over there. They're storming in and the police start shooting. 25 people are dead. Do you know how the Syrian civil war started? Millions of people died because one child went outside and he started spray painting on a wall that Bashar al-Assad is the devil. They arrested him, he eventually died. This is a snowball effect. Once there's blood on hands, right now there was one woman that was killed, but if there were 25 people that were killed, there's a lot of people in the US that get pissed off about that. Then they're filled with even more rage. And not only is it just a bunch of rural people that are filled with rage, every institution in the US has subsections of people that absolutely sympathize with these people. So if these people break off and they start attacking the government, the government from within will start collapsing. Because then you would have factions within Pentagon that would say, actually, no, we're not gonna do this. Then their bosses, my understanding at this point is that most of Trump support or the cultist Trump support is, is widespread in most institutions in the US, but it's still at the mid managerial level or at the lower level. Is that right? That is from, from what I understand. So the operational ones of the Pentagon are relieved that Biden's in? Yes but the rank and file and even their middle management is not. They think their country has been taken away from them. 
So you have this dilemma over here, which is why this needs to be treaded on very, very carefully. You got everyone, first of all, every non-American, shut the fuck up. This is actually really serious. This is not a joke. This isn't like you can just put Trump in jail and everything's gonna be better. This could lead to their society absolutely collapsing. They, there's precedent of this happening already. They had a civil war. So, and I think Joe Biden recognizes this because Joe Biden said that he, he has made this public. He is, He's claimed this. He's like he is not comfortable with being associated in any way uh, of trying Trump after he comes into presidency, and he is one hundred percent right. That's a ticking time bomb. If he if he goes too much into it, if he starts like doing these political vendettas, there will be a political backlash, and this will get even dirtier. Right now, most people are just looking at Trump's uh, uh, supporters as these crazy. Um, SUV driving uh, um, rural folks that come in and they're like, we want our guns. There's a lot of that too, but then there's a lot more. That's why every election we get surprised by how many people vote for Trump. Isn't it would, 2016 election, 2020 election, Trump's gonna get wiped away. Of course he's crazy. But every time we realize that close to 49% of the people like him, they're not all those uh, SUV driving, they, and I think it's the, for, for the US, it's the last, white lash what they you know like their society is fundamentally changing and these are long-term demographic effects because i because i'm trying to understand what is really getting them angry and i i think it's that no i think it's an inflammation information it's an inflammation of the Koch brothers have built up a media network that is pretty much on par with cnn and msnbc so this kind of thing was just like, we're living in two Americas. It's clearly designed. Mm. I hate this idea that there's just this kind of like cultural rift that happened. Really what's happening is there's two media networks that are exploiting and creating a cultural rift for a vote count. I mean, this is what well, Chomsky's always the, talking about the in the Republican factions, Party, right? Right? Those are the right? Those are the media represented by But this is the whole thing. Don't, this is the point that I was making about Trump. Don't you think that there is no chance in hell that that guy would be president if this was the 90s? You wouldn't have access to social media to begin with. The elite wouldn't be desperate enough to pick somebody that's as loose cannony as he is. They just would have quelled him entirely. They'd be like, I don't give a shit how popular you are. We're making George Jeb Bush the winner, right? But the thing is, what people forget is that Trump, during the primaries, how he just said, I did it alone. He started gaining ground really quickly. But then Rupert Murdoch sensed a winner. And he thought, fuck this guy could actually t take the clench hold of the presidency. So he started backing him. And then after that, obviously, all of the conservative radio talk show hosts fell in line. Mm. The Koch brother network eventually realized, yeah, we can live with Trump. And so then they backed him. And then the banks started thinking, yeah, no, we can give that guy money. And so it kind of just had this snowball effect of the elites realizing that's the horse to bet on. Well, so it wasn't this factions thing of the elite. That's yeah, exactly. what I'm saying. Factions yeah, yeah. of the elite. But if this was the 90s and uh you know like they were just rewriting the new world order after the soviet union had collapsed the, the entire elite network i think would just be perfectly fine with either bob dole or bill clinton being president they wouldn't give a shit so they wouldn't be stoking these huge cultural rifts well, yeah. like they are now. But we're living in different times. You're exactly. right. Exactly. We're living and in social different media times. But the thing is that like this idea that it's just kind of like this organic movement that Trump is taking. I no, don't think that that's the case. Absolutely, it's like completely manufactured. It's absolutely not. And and again, the more re the more information that's being unraveled. Here's another theory. I can't confirm this, but another theory is that the reason why Capitol Hill police is being uh, investigated. So a lot of people are saying that they're doing this because this was a clear security lapse. Like they failed to do this, heads would roll. Apparently, that's not even accurate. Yes, there was a security lapse, but the security lapse was because a lot of people working at that Capitol Hill position were sympathetic with the rioters. They were okay with them coming in, in many instances. In fact, there's videos where they're shown that where police is just standing on the side. They're arguing that we're saying this, uh, we did this because the crowds were just overwhelming that there was no reason to fight them. So we let them in. And then there's another theory where they're like, you kind of were agreeing with the rioters. So this is what happens a lot of the time, even in revolutions, when there's like an army line in front of you against the mass of the people, 
The break point isn't that the masses, the people will overwhelm you. The break point is that the the front line of the soldier that's supposed to defend is sympathetic with the people that are coming yeah, in. Yeah, so, yeah. so he has no capacity, will, or even power to stop them. Mm. Like he, he feels humiliation if he's supposed to stop them. So mm. then these other theories that people within Capitol Hill police force were sympathetic and they let, which means, which is why there's, a, 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 in my opinion, they're being investigated on. It's not just a security lapse, but it's also to what extent were people sympathetic. How loyal are you? And, and how loyal were you? And how much were you okay with this happening? But he, this is the other thing. Don't you think that the vast majority of the footage that I saw wasn't violent? Well, it wasn't, but it like was... It, it, virtually, it, there seems to be a riot in the US every month. And yeah. this one seemed to be the least violent out of all of them. Like, really, most of the footage that I saw was them just marching into Capitol Hill. Some people were, like, taking signs and stuff like that. But it seems like everyone was it's kind of like a tourist event yeah, almost. Yeah, free-for-all kind of situation. Well, that's how rides often are, right? It was that 1984 exploiting a situation, and then there was just this, oh, my God, this is so dangerous. We've got to do something about Donald Trump. I think the but for a riot... It seemed very tame. It, I'm sure the French much Revolution worse. was a lot more lit. Yeah, you know? it was. It was. But the, I think the, the 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 symbolicness of this, because look, people marching onto like uh, uh, any country's version of the parliament is actually really common. But it's usually a sign of a banana republic. For example, in Pakistan, the same thing happened in the 90s. But then no one gets weirded out by that because it's fucking Pakistan. Mm. And it's just like rioters marching on to your parliament is a very uh, common Symbolic. a common thing amongst failing states it's happened yeah. it ha it's happened often so yeah, for the US, you know what was the most i was watching cnn and this was kind of sad but at the same time uh, weirdly uh, satisfying um, so the C so they were reporting so this was just after the riots had happened right they were still trying to make sense of what the fuck happened and um, so i think it was cuomo He's talking Fresh to this uh, this woman who's like CNN's uh, foreign correspondent station in the UK, and so he's asking her, "What's your what's like the what's the reaction of the international community?" And she she mentions Turkey's response. So this was Turkey's response. Turkey said after right after the riots, they said, um, "We would encourage Turkish citizens to avoid crowded spaces." We also believe that American democracy is strong and will overcome this, and uh, and no amount of uh, whatever will be able to dent the great democracy that America is. Right. The sad part was it was Turkey saying this to the U.S. Yeah. And Cuomo almost started crying. Really? Cuomo was like, because it it wasn't. It would have almost been better if uh, if uh, uh, Erdogan's statement was "ha ha losers," like I said, but it wasn't. What happened was in that moment, U.S. was a banana republic and Turkey was a well-functioning country. <laughs> That's what made them really sad, and I could see it on their faces. And yeah. honestly, that is a sad thing. The, the, that is, but that's where like the U.S. is now. U.S. is a it's. But it's, don't you think that if, if the U.S. was a failed state? I honestly think that would be better for the world. It's not a failed state at the moment. No, right? but if it's going towards that yeah. and it just gets severely uh, impoverished and they're no longer holding the clutch on climate action or not. Because the thing is, look, Joe Biden won this round, barely. Mm. Next election, Trump will probably come back and he'll probably win like, with a, well, with a the majority difficult bit or whatever. Is, but even if it's not Trump, whoever is coming back is representing is that faction. Yeah, and they're representing fossil fuels. And so it'll just be this constant back and forward. And the whole system is designed anyway to be gridlock. Mm -hmm. In fact, I got Christo to look into it to just make like a difference between Australian and US politics. And I don't know if I'm ever going to do it. But uh, yeah, pretty much he was just saying it, it would have to be the worst designed system in the world. The whole system is designed for nothing to happen. Mm -hmm. So it like thrives off of gridlock. But it thrives off of like two factions just a permanent log. But that's a double-edged sword because the problem with that system is, oh, look, it's great for fucked up things not happening, but it's also very potent to frustration. But this is the whole thing. That system, especially that system being the most important system on earth designed to fight something like climate change, it's which probably is just outdated this like now. encroaching, ever-looming threat that gets worse and worse and worse. 
I can't think of a worse system than that. Well, it's clearly evident now. There's people storming into the Capitol Hill. So, like, that's case in point. That's the that's the thing. Like, we are almost seeing this place crumble right before our eyes. It was really weird. You know what else as well? Did you watch Newsmax and uh, Fox News? Um, yeah, I watched Fox News a little bit. Yeah, why? Their coverage was horrified. No, they, they, yeah, they, they, they were just like, this is not America. This is not how we resolve conflict here. All of that stuff. Yeah. But their audience was not on board with that. I've never seen higher dislike ratios on Fox News and Newsmax videos. The most. So th- yeah. the mob wants blood. The mob wants blood. And look, they recognize that. You know, I think the most informed people at this moment in the country are people like. Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham. Mitch McConnell. Because they understand how fucked up this reality is, but I think they also understand how fucking explosive this can be. It's This is a problem that third world countries face all the time. What do you... Yeah, go on. Uh, so, like, for example, like, in, in Pakistan, uh, whatever leader you get has to tread really... I'll give you an example of this exact conundrum. After 9-11... George Bush calls up the Pakistani uh, president Musharraf and says, you're either with us or you're against us, right? So which means you fight these terrorists or you are one of the countries that we're gonna bomb. He had, he was in such a bad position because on one hand, if he refuses the US, he'll, as he says in his book, he will be bombed back to Stone Age. Um, If he supports US, his biggest concern was that the army that he is going to ask to go and fight these terrorists are ethnically the same as the terrorists. So now he is afraid that if I say, even though he personally agrees with Bush, he, he doesn't like these extremists. Like obviously he would rather them be killed, but he knows that if I, if I, if I go too strong at this, my, there might be a rebellion in my army. Because what he was afraid, and this was happening, and I saw this, like soldiers would go back to their house and they would be hurled abuses that you are supporting the enemy and you're killing your fellow Muslim men. That's the reality that these soldiers were living in. Bush was completely oblivious to this, right? Because he, he, he for him, it's like, we need to get vengeance for 9-11. And rightly so, that's the country that he represents. So Musharraf had to like constantly say, okay, I understand how these people are literally bombing my own countrymen but I cannot take them out immediately because the repercussion of that could be even worse. This is, this, these are the sort of conundrums that um, third world countries face all the time. This is the conundrum that the US is facing right now. So all those uh, Democrats that are uh, saying, let's be heavy handed, let's tell these uh, criminals where they belong, very quickly you'd realize that 48% of the country is those. Mm. And then what do you do? Mm. Kill 48%? Mm. You might but those 48% would want to kill the 52% too. And that's how you get civil wars. Immediately, if there is something of that sort, God fucking forbid, all of a sudden what you'd see is, so for example, certain army facility in Kentucky, which is right now the US army facility, is now a base for the rebellion. Mm. Uh, An army city in Wisconsin is now a base for the North. Mm. And then you would have the, this, the, the greatest, the mightiest military in the world that has ever existed be split into two. Mm. And then they will start fighting each other with the most modern machines that ha- have ever been created. And that's a doomsday scenario for the entire world. This civil war yeah, is the Syrian civil that, war. Though, well, I think the stakes are too big. It can't, but I don't know what this, this civil war looks like. It has the potential to be doomsday. The weapons are completely different now. And this isn't Syria. When US tells Syria, you cannot use chemical weapons, Syria is afraid because the US is the biggest military in the world. Do you think the Australian military will tell US military don't use chemical weapons? I'm not saying that they will, but do you think we have any kind of like hard power to do shit like that? Yeah. Who the fuck are we? We've got a shitty small military. Mm. Sorry, not shitty. We've got a smaller military comparative. Hey, our SAS soldiers punch above their weight. But for that matter, any country in the world, the only country that comes even close to being able to call some sort of shots is China. France. But, but even they won't be able to do it. US Army military is way too big. Mm. You know the, the the figure that we always call that they're bigger than like the next. Speaker. Yeah, in a civil war, that would matter. Mm. It will be, every each faction would be five times bigger than any other country in the world. 
And you know what else as well? Maybe this time the south shall rise again and stay there. Because I'd imagine that most of the soldiers would be southerners. I think they'd lose again if that happened. The southerners would lose again because... Maybe if they did actually demand secession, they would get it this time. Because everyone would realize, oh, they've got nukes now. No country, and this is a rule, no country ever allows secession unless it's super weak. If you look at any country that has allowed a, a part of it to be broken away is usually after like some sort of war where they've been crippled, um, even revolutions. So for example, like Russian revolution, coincident, it, it's not a coincidence, it happened right after the first world war when Tsar was the weakest. Chinese revolution happened right after civil war in China and the second world war. Usually you need a country to be collapsing for secession to actually happen smoothly. Mm. If your country isn't like if your country isn't in the midst of world war is economically collapsing, they'll fight to keep it. Mm. No country, no mm. matter how democratic, how enlightened or how dumb, will give up territory. Well, Charlie Joe Biden's hands now. It is all Don't you think that he is the ultimate compromise candidate though? I'm going to be that pissed off at that guy. If I anybody think, is going to avert a civil war, it's that man. Yeah, and he is... He The thing is, I'm, I'm satisfied that he is... Um, he, he recognizes the He recognizes the threat, yeah. And, and he's also very cautious. And as you were he's saying, so does Mitch McConnell. So is Mitch McConnell. But that's the whole thing. It's the old guard. The old guard recognizes what's happening. What do you think Trump's thinking right now? Well, I think Trump... Uh, Trump, I don't... Trump isn't that smart to like understand the repercussions of it i think trump genuinely thinks he was cheated from this election I is think that what he's he still thinking about i think that's what he's he's like they're they're trying to pressure me when clearly we know that we've won the elections i think he's a bit of a psychopath in that way he genuinely thinks he's won the elections do you think it was a good move that they banned him from twitter well i don't think it serves any purpose that has nothing to do with how that it, that has nothing to do with making situation better all twitter is trying to do is save face Twitter is because look I wouldn't want to be in like these positions either Twitter and Facebook like they have to deal with this situation where they're getting abuses from the left for letting Trump incite violence throughout his presidency and on the other hand they have the issue of yeah but you're only half of the population half the population love this guy and the guy that you're asking me to kick off of my platform happens to be my fucking president <laughs> like he is the president of this country Again, this is a very uh, difficult line to, to tread on. And these social media giants have so much power and they genuinely don't know what to do. Twitter banning him is like, it's a reactionary move because they, they, they don't want to be in a situation where Joe Biden comes into power, puts a Senate hearing, asks them and says, you are culpable in this. Um, tell us what went wrong. Why did you allow this incitement? And then there's in that situation, at least now they'll be like, well, as soon as we find out, we, we actually suspended Yeah, that's what I thought account. as well. Donald Trump, uh, that's, yeah, if he won the next election, there is no way that Twitter would have banned him. Yeah. Even if he was inciting this massive mob, they, and it was like 50 times the size, they still would wouldn't have banned him. Yes, because you're right. They, they would have never banned him if he had won uh, the election. Maybe it would have been better if Trump won the next election. We just took one for the team in terms of the carbon footprint, got down to business with a 98 year old Joe Biden. That's actually, I was, I remember reading this three years ago where um, this academic, I think he was on ABC radio. He was an American academic that ABC radio had got over. And he was talking about like, again, at that point, how divided the country was and all that stuff. And he was saying how great it was that President Trump actually won 2016 elections. Because he was saying that if you had created the blue wall, then there was no room for these people to influence po politics in any which way. So there was more likely to be friction. So he was happy that Trump had won 2016 because he was like, maybe that will absorb it. And then uh, I think it was the radio host who said that, well, that's good. Then in like 2020, um, if Joe Biden wins, that can let pacify them. And this academic was saying, no, actually in order for this storm, this calm to remain calm is Trump would need to win eight years mm. that's what would pacify this mm. um and now i'm realizing maybe he was right this was like he was saying this in 2017 what do you think he's going to do now that he's well when he's no longer president well i think he, do you think he's just going to retire 
No, I mean, not for politics. I think he would like himself to be the kingmaker of the Republican Party. And by default, he will be. Yeah. He, he, he will be the kingmaker of the Republican Party. Republican Party has a lot of work to do. The Republican Party has a lot of difficult work to do because the leadership recognizes how their base is batshit crazy. The base hates this leadership. They like Trump. Mm. So if you, so, so I, if you abandon the Republican Party, then it's going to be just the faction that is, it, it'll just be Trump. If you stay within it, you'll be purged out eventually unless you toe line. It's a very fucked up situation to be in. As a, as, as a, as a decently intelligent Republican, I hate my life mm. because I don't know what to do. People like Lindsey Graham, he's the, he's the Senator of Kentucky, right? His entire population agrees with Trump. Mm. Even though they elected him, mm. they still, they're, they're on the Trump train. Mm. And so he's this guy who recognizes what the fuck he has to deal with at home. Mm. So he's perfectly aware of where the country is going. It's the Democrats who live in New York and be like, well, crazy, this is anarchy. We're not a banana republic. If, you, if you're going to storm Capitol Hill, we will crush you. Mm. Try doing it. Mm. Try doing it and see what happens. Well, this is a chilling endeavor of things to come. Yeah. Uh, should we get off? Well, yeah, someone is saying, is Ali a Republican? <laughs> no, I am not a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> I understand where that's how it might be perceived that I am a man who is risk averse. I hate Republicans, but I also hate civil wars, baby. <laughs> um, but before we go, yeah, you're mistaking Mislove for Ali. <laughs> yeah, He's true. the Republican. Yeah, Mislove's more, more Republican. Um, for those of you that are saying, why isn't Mislove here? We mentioned it on the pre show, Mislove couldn't be here today because he locked himself in a car. Yeah, no, 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 he locked himself out of a car. Yeah, yeah. So he- and so he's sitting around <laughs> waiting for RMA. Maybe they've come, maybe they haven't. He also had to go to a birthday dinner, but I do like the thought of him sitting out the front just being like, I'm cool. <laughs> so I'm just going with that. We hope that he's still there. God willing, he is. God willing, because he, he'll be here next week. Um, for those of you that sent in your um, applications for the producer role, thank you very much. We're actually in the last phase of um, shortlisting it and calling out um, and, and calling or like calling people for interviews. So thank you for that. Lastly. And yeah. Um, let's do react video. So one of the things that Jordan, Miss Love and I were thinking of is that we'll do react videos. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even us that were thinking about it. It was my niece and she was like, you're an idiot. Haven't you ever watched any other Twitch stream before? You're supposed to be reacting to memes yeah. and then you can just use that content easily to get more views on YouTube. So pretty much that's what I'm saying now. Can you just be our generator of ideas for us? Can you just do the show? How about that? Do the that's show. the new deal from now on. Start off with sending us uh, memes that you would like to react, that you would like Jordan and us to. And videos as well. And don't do any of that 4 chan shit of showing us like a, a dog getting killed in Vietnam or something. I don't want to look at that. Yeah. And now that I've said that, it's definitely going to happen. But can we just keep it to a minimum? All of the, um, uh, all the memes that you would want us to do it, uh, act, send it to us. Uh, send it to me via my Instagram. My Instagram handle is up on your screen. Uh, this has, Whoa. Yeah, this has two I'll effects. I'll with the tech. This has two effects. We get the memes and also I get more follows on Instagram. Yes, yes. I don't know why you care so much about being an Insta thought. I don't know. <laughs> why do you know. give a shit? I'm just a chick. And, and, and also it's the fact that you've lived in the Western suburbs too long and you forget that there are other social media platforms yeah, like yeah, Snapchat yeah. and Instagram. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so yeah, uh, send, me, send me the memes through Instagram. And for those of you that are listening in and can't see the screen right now, um, just look for me on Instagram. It's uh, shaheryarali.1992. And we'll do it next week. Thank you for joining us. And, Thank you. Uh, Appreciate it very much. We will see you next week. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank you, though. That's nice.